right, guys. So welcome back to Canadian Beef Podcast. We have a really amazing guest on today, Kurt Havens. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, yes. Thanks. thanks for having me here. And Benoit, of course. BLP, thank you, thank you. Thanks for your time. So I read I the just, book. I just got his book. Yep. So I, I, there you go. I, I didn't sleep that night. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's magnificent, Kurt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it's both intimidating, you know, because I'm I'm a guru, uh, you know, a coach for hormones, but I cannot do that. You know what I mean? But I will use it. Um, and it's uh, you, it's it's another level of um, I could say this. I don't know how you did you manage to collide so much wide knowledge and in a fairly simple matters, you know, you, you have to be so aware to make it simple. I'm not saying in layman, you know, and you could get complex too. There's both satisfaction there, but uh, there's, there's some long sentence. They're so flowy and clear. You probably had to process like 10 times, you know, just to, for the structure of sentence, you know, there's a lot of work. It's, it's condensed, it's short, it flow like water. But for the execution of it, I, oh my God, you should have went to quite a process. Um, yeah, I mean, I I edited it several times. I wrote it relatively quickly. Um, it was kind of a passion of mine. When I sat down and I committed to writing it, it only took me a couple of weeks. I was using a couple of computers at the same time so I could reference all this stuff. And I then gave it to a couple of friends of different levels of education and experience with this stuff. Uh, including my wife who does my web stuff. So she's the one who formatted that. And I wanted it to make sense to both a doctor and to someone who just would pick it up and read it to some extent. If that makes any sense. So it was kind of a blend there, I think, be, right? Because I could, you could write it as a science book, but then it'd be really boring. And you could but it's write it. It's not boring. It's not boring. I would that's, say I, that was my goal. The most entertaining. Yeah, because there's 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 open to experiential, there's openness to, you know, if, yes, this is knowledge, but you have your own path, you know, you're not too like regulatory, there's kind of a libertarian approach to it, you know, which is kind of, I don't know, it's kind of atypical, I guess, you know, I don't know, you know, such, such especially that someone that's uh, kind of uh, fruitful in research analysis and understanding, you know. It was, uh, it's, it's very well done. Everyone, it's a must. Everyone should buy it. We're not, we're going to promo. Kurt Evans. You should buy it, you know, or, or buy it in like in gang, you know, because it's easy to share PDF. You can put four or five guys together buying the book, you know, to be fair uh, in team. Um, listen, I have many, many, many questions. I don't know if we're going to. Sure. All we'll do of it. Best. Yep. Whatever you want to go. go. <laughs> What's that? Whatever direction you want to go, Benoit, we'll, we'll go. Yes, yeah. yes. I, I have about, I don't know, maybe 30-ish question. You know? Robin, did you have a chance? Did well, you have a chance well, to look at it? Of, of course. Yeah. I've been reading through it and taking notes. Oh, cool. Um, okay. So yeah, like myself as an HGH user for now a decade, and I, I think this is brilliant. It's absolutely comprehensive. It's amazing. Thank you. I um and again, we'll probably find as we discuss it that there are some things that I might have said that my opinion might have said they've changed. Over time, right? I think that that's kind of the interesting thing about science is I'm not really stuck to any of this stuff. I it was it was how I felt and what the research showed me at the moment. And I think as it evolves, I'll probably have to do a, a second release of the book or a third release. Absolutely, Speaking because, of yeah, this stuff, yeah, we're yeah. always learning, and I and I'm learning just as much from guys like you, right? We don't. No one knows all the answers to this stuff. I just I, I figured it would make sense if we could get like a compiled a, a compiled version of all of the research in one book. And that's kind of what the market was lacking is there was just no one reference for all this stuff. Yeah. Um, that being said, some of it's right. As we interpret it, we might realize that some of it's not correct. Fair. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it toward the conclusion for the opening or the following of the second edition, because there, there's so many, there's no, so many correlative factor that it's not in the book that could be if yeah. they're interested in you and stuff, because it's, it's, it's such a systemic science, you know. It goes through uh, autism, sleep pattern, cognition, the spatial temporal intelligence, uh, uh, awareness, focus. Uh, you know, there's many, many others layers that not only muscle specific, you know. Um, 
anyway, my first question is like, I always find that with growth hormone and expen exponential uh, hypertrophy, there's, yes, the myostatin count, which has a genetic factor, but especially immune system. So what I mean by that is I know there's correlation of growth hormone and histamine, but in some ways there's, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a, the human has a certain youth invincible for growth. You know, I find that someone that's relatively younger answer better to growth hormone, let's say mid 20 to mid 30 ish. Um, and my question is at the intersection of inflammation, satellite cells, proliferation, hypertrophy. My question is like, where, what will be the best tool to kind of have the immune function or the inflammatory marker in someone that will technically abuse of growth hormone, you know, in the 10, 15, 10 plus units kind of framework, just not because I, I call to abuse, but in some ways, when you go through Olympia level, you're so oh, out yes. of the, the human genome or the human demographic that you're in the freak level. And, you know, and, and, and not only that is Olympia catered to the best, let's say, um, myostatin pro gene that it coming into Whatever. their, you know, the, the, especially when it comes to the top 10, you know, so, and they almost kind of look alike eventually, you know, genetically, morphologically mm -hmm. speaking. Some might have less uh, 1GF1 in, in, in receptor of their stomach. They kind of cable like a Sean Rogan type of big muscle mm -hmm. kind of belly waist. But my question is like how you could hack or how you could tune in a correlation of the maximal growth hormone possible for itself and immune function processing modulation. What would be your your advice? That's a um, that's a tough question. Um, I well, I would think you would look for like if you're looking for immune response, you'd probably look for yes. for markers first, right? Yes, it's more it's more inflammation. You know, PRP, you could control like inflammation with something that kind of stress the body to a certain extent. You know. Yeah, so I would I would probably start with something like CRP. You would just want to make sure that there's not some sort of really high systemic level of inflammation, but, but you need, you need interleukins to be increased at the same time in order to get satellite cell proliferation. See, tell, tell us more, tell us more. That's does that, does that make any sense? Do, do you sense. Going with this? So yeah. with, and that's what we've seen. This is one of the reasons why Tremblone works with satellite cells is because of the interleukin response that you get from it. Um, so there, the inflammatory response is required for this growth, right? In the satellite cell response, because you're, it's, it's not damage per se that you're healing, but it's, it's the response to mechanical tension that, that allows the mechanical growth, mechanical growth factor to go to the cell is, is that inflammation response, right? So if you were to stop that full, that response fully, you would not get that growth response where that satellite cell pro proliferation. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that answer your question with that? Yeah, but that's pro pro inflammatory. Me, I'm talking about inflammation yeah. in terms of glial cell, like the, the the negative inflammatory pathways. So specifically from growth hormone, well, I don't believe there would be any well, negative. Well, let let's say let's see if if there's a correlation. I think there is of aldosterone, renin, okay. and growth hormone higher use. So how you will uh, optimize? sodium potassium balance with aldosterone function optimizing growth hormone what what will be the 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 protocol of maybe would be nutrition or supplement or modalities could of be, i mean there's probably lots of ways probably increasing so i only have one kidney i don't know if you're aware of that i was born with one kidney so i tend to deal with fluid balance a little differently than a normal person so my nephrologist has me consume more fluid with growth hormone that a normal person would consume to kind of balance some of that out. I think there could be other things used, right? Like guys use Tomasartan nowadays to help balance some of this, these things out. Um, nutrition, you probably want to make sure that your sodium and potassium intake is adequate, right? That you're not hypokalemic, that you're not, then you're not also too high in sodium. Um, how would you measure that? Like for someone that doesn't know, how, how would you know if you're hypokalemic just walking around? 
but oh, I mean, you would have to get lab work done. Uh, I mean, as as anyone that's if you're using growth hormone, especially in a large amount, you should definitely be getting labs done. I think For sure. What I've noticed, I don't know what your experience is when I brought the growth hormone up, as you titrate the dose up, there is some definite fluid retention, right? Initially, but a lot of that then drops out over time. Like it doesn't stay. Like it's just your kidneys are going to hold more sodium. And so you'll just store fluid from it. And then over time it decreases. I don't know what the amount, like I've used 18 units. I've used a bottle of serostim a day. And initially there's a lot of bloating that occurs. And then it it seems to to drop out after a couple of weeks. And then um, you lose the majority of it. I think that when you bring the dose down to a more sane level, then you lose even more that you didn't even realize you were holding from that. But I don't think it becomes like a, a, a stressful or a, a, like an inflammation response per se. Mm -hmm. Do you would consider do you would consider this like because growth hormone is kind of a smart drugs the body would kind of correlate to a certain it becomes uh, homeostatic at some point of uh, equilibrium or yes it's going to always reach homeostasis at some point right and it's something wrong um, I think a lot of the generics as well I don't know what what brands you guys are looking at a lot of the generics also have diuretics in them that kind of stop some of this from occurring. Right, like a malatol or something, right? Yeah, a lot. Almost all of them have malatol. Serastim does not. Yeah, um, and that's what usually correlates the added water weight, right? Yeah, uh, supposedly. I mean, yeah. I used a little bit of generics. Um, I've not really noticed much in the difference in water. I, I, the only difference I noticed, in case I don't want to go too far in the wrong direction, in case this is a question related. The only difference I've really noticed with generics is that they don't dissolve quite as well. Mm -hmm. the bacteria static water and they don't and sometimes they leave a little bit of irritation under the skin i think it's just extra fillers the average generic that i've seen has you know six to ten extra fillers in there whereas the pharmaceutical stuff generally has one or two the thing, when it comes to the fascia and the derm there's correlation of histamine and cross reactivity it's not a question of allergy per se it's more allergy by correlation and a cross reactivity pattern so that's why you get welt or skin reaction okay. because Technically, it's more of a human response related to sugar. So it's often it's not maltiloid, but it's a sucralose or sugar derivative. Yeah. And the yeah. person eating sugar, so sugar upon sugar and fascia where the derm is actually very fragile, and especially in, let's say, Western culture where we all have some kind of correlation of autoimmune function. It's pretty relatable, but it's relatable to sugar sensitivity in terms of cross-reactivity pattern at the collective of our immune function of living today in this world, you know, a world Western, you know, let's say call it polluent or pollution or whatsoever. Because I know Serastim, Serastim does use sucrose versus the malatol, yeah. some of the generics use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is my question is, is then it's like when you say gh suppression is this suppression at the thalamic or hypothalamus or what kind of when you say gh suppression you never really extend fully on it i thought it was in and even me i'm not fully sure when i when i when i hear gh suppression i always think at the hypothalamic function I'm of about hypothalamic response yes Yes. So let's say you're someone using eight, 10 units or more for about a decade. Someone like me, like I did, I did growth hormone a lot, but 10 years ago, you know, now I'm not using it. Uh, and I don't plan to, I don't think so. What will, what you will think, did I affect my hypothalamic health or there is some kind of glial regeneration and I'm okay. What kind of, uh, I, of course I'm still, much more uh, muscular, let's say, than the average 50 years old around myself. Mm -hmm. Even though, you know, I did GH a long time ago, you know, it's very hard for me to be under 230. I have to start beyond that, you know, to be all that weight, you know. And uh, what, what was my, my correlation was like, can you explain more suppression in a technical technicalities? And if, let's say, we, me and Dor Robin here, we use growth hormone for 10, 15 years. It is correlation of suppression in older age when I retire, or I should, uh, I should once in the, let's say, you know, post retirement, go back to a certain level of therapeutical growth hormone because I did so much younger. What's your, what's your angle? I would, I, some of it's going to be anecdotal. I would say, have you, have you done a growth hormone serum test recently to check yours? No, 
I would be curious. I would, from what I've seen is there shouldn't be the same level of suppression as if similar to what the opposite of what you would see in someone that uses testosterone, right? So if you use testosterone for, you know, a couple of years, it's say your, your total serum was, you know, 600 you use testosterone for a decade. And now when you come off, if assuming everything is functioning correctly, you might only be at 400 max now, right? You're probably never going to get back to where you were previously with growth hormone. That doesn't really seem to be the case. What you're, what you would probably see is some level of somatopause though, because of your age, because you're significantly older now than when you started, not the testosterone wouldn't follow a similar pattern, but I don't think it's as extreme. So you think it's less relevant with GH than testosterone? I, that's what I've seen. Because of the natural decline. That's what I've seen. I think you're just going to get some natural decline with age. I don't think you're going to get so much suppression from use. Mm. Um, so, it doesn't seem to have any the same long-term effects. Mm. So like that, testosterone, you can replace it over time. Um, and so what, what would you say is like the ultimate anti-aging? Is it two IUs the, the go-to? Well, they say 1.7, right, for 200 220 pound man, give or take, mm -hmm. give or take. Um, I would always just round up to two. Yeah. Say if you wanted to, again, a lot of this is anecdotal. We don't have a ton of long term studies on healthy individuals using this for decades, right? We sure. can look to guys like Sylvester Stallone, who, you know, we can assume what he's doing. I don't know for a fact. I don't know the man. I don't want to accuse him of anything. But I, I, my assumption is that he's using growth hormone. He's been using it for a long time and he's probably using a relatively responsible dose. Responsible, I mean, probably under five IUs for a period of time, right? Like you and I both know that like, if you want a result, you're going to use more, but you're probably not going to stay on 10, 12, 15, what indefinitely, right? That's not a wise decision. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say you somewhere between one and two, depending on the size of the person you could use with, assuming everything else is fine, right? Like you're not prone to being diabetic and you're not experiencing these side effects. You could probably use indefinitely. Mm -hmm. Versus I would use much more than that for like long periods of time. Right. Yeah. Okay. So because... but I don't, but I've never seen any actual, I, I don't have any data to show actual suppression. So doctors will prescribe using some odd methods, right? Like mm -hmm. six days on one day off the five, two was a bodybuilding thing that was to save money, basically. Right. There was really no science there. The only two medical in disease states, the only two ones that I ever see, um, is every day and every other day. That's really the standard that's used for HIV. Mm -hmm. It's used every day. You think it's from a neuro neuroevolutionary standpoint? It will not be. It will be so detrimental to health that there's a protective survival effect that you cannot technically suppress GH because it's essential for kind of a correlation of one GF and lifespan. So there's kind of a. Well, we see we see almost total suppression in in some children now. We you see basically IGF takes over the functions of GH at least short term. Those are pathological issue, but I mean for someone that's let's say healthy parameter. Healthy. Oh no, I mean in that in that in that respect, I would say you're not fully it's, it's kind of a, a given for life if you're not on the on the 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 the, the, the misdraw of the genetic pool. If right. you're relatively, your growth hormone is yes. kind of a given for life. It's yeah. not like thyroid function or testosterone, which we could be. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Damaged long-term. Yeah. I, I don't, I've not seen anything that would show long-term negative effects there. Wow. Well, but again, I've not seen. Yeah, I'm, I'm learning a lot. <laughs> but I don't think, I, but again, so what would be fascinating to see is I know, I know some people with HIV that have been on a bottle of Seristim for long periods of time. It would be interesting to see them come off and see see after time what actually happened to their hypothalamus but again i i wouldn't ethically i wouldn't ask them to do that right that doesn't make a lot of sense it's not like valid mm -hmm. to study all these people who are ill fair yeah and it might not even be relevant to what we're trying to right? do we also don't know what else is causing damage right yeah yeah well one I thing mean, i learned from this book for sure is that gh is it's complicated <laughs> more so than and i think that that's something else as I was writing it, you realize that it's, there's a ton of stuff out there on it. It's been studied for a long time, as long as testosterone. It's just that it is so complicated in its function, right? And we don't know, there's still a lot that we just don't know about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting um, how it's 
talking about the uh, the GH media effect, GH mediated effect of promoting the muscle cell growth, which is independent of the IGF one, uh, mostly due to creating more nuclei within the muscle cell. So this is when people are talking about we're getting like the hypo hyperplasia effect. So is there like a ceiling on this? Is is there is the ceiling on this ability to create more and more nuclei? Is that regulated by myostatin or is that regulated by something else? It, most likely by something else. I don't think we fully understand what those regulatory factors are. Myostatin most likely plays a role, but it seems like myostatin's role is more in utero than it is in an adult. So there is something that's occurring in both of our bodies that's stopping this process at some point, mm -hmm. and it's driven by our genetics. What it, right. what it is, no one can say for sure, right? And you, you see it in anabolic steroids at day 50, there's a switch, right? Mm -hmm. So whether whether it's myostatin, myostatin plus something else, just myostatin, I, I'm hesitant to say just myostatin. I think it's one of those things that we just fully don't understand. Like it probably ramps up, like as you get closer to that ceiling, more and more of these effects take over to stop you from, depending on your genetics, depending on the environment, like so many things, right? Yeah. Well, like, have you seen the animal studies with the day 50? Do you know what I'm referring to? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. All mammals. So again, we don't fully understand that process, but we know that in basically all mammals around that time, there's a switch from, from increased protein synthesis, right? To some level of anti-catabolism that's still allowing growth, but it's just the process is switching. And that's probably where the, the extra myonuclei are just not occurring at the same rate anymore. That process is going to downregulate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So in in the book in the book you use the 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 word often pulsatile, mm -hmm. and the, the way I see it from my own perspective as a practitioner, uh, more from the neurology functional medicine uh, let's say uh, interpretation, um, we look more at the circadian chronobiology. So we're looking more like a timing pattern because there's circadian vestibular, the lungs, the gene clock, ligament, everything has some kind of a circadian rhythm all organ does even the brain and and in some ways it's like you pulsatile morning for cortisol let's say growth hormone of course maybe a big inert will be some kind of such a, a clash of lethargy so that's why sometimes i'm careful i'm kind of careful to give a pulsology at the morning for a right beginner you know it's kind of almost like too much of a of a shock. And I would say like before workout, which would be the cardiac output because the hippocampal, uh, axonal, uh, uh, focus, uh, really like neurotransmitter base um, and the, the cardiac output also. So a pre-workout kind of thing. And then post-workout, post-workout would be more like the, let's say the 1GF, MGF repair, repair of osteoblast, ligament, cartilage, bone, nerve regeneration, you know. It's very hard to heal nerve, but I think GH does. To a certain some yeah. And where it matters the most, it was a be at night because at night it's where the 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 maximal of of repair and regeneration happen. You know, both at the glial and immune function and 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 homeostasis and the the systemic level of recovery in terms of dam REM sleep, architecture of sleep, condensed sleep. And that was something that in the book, I will have put another uh, another chapter just on the, the axis of circadian repair on sleep for growth hormone, because there's ex there's actually study being on it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, on PubMed and research and stuff. And um, so do you consider, let's say, a pulsatile of morning cortisol, pre-workout, post-workout repair and sleep? That would be very prognosis and at the same time is the pulsatile need to be habitual or if you do in high dose it would be at the surprise level like let's say you take gh four times a week but few times a week you do a lot in a non-consequential non-anticipatory level some mm -hmm. kind of a, using like a spurt of surprise to make sure that the multi-pharmacology of steroids and salary etc the body never actually access to adaptation. Does that make sense? It does. I've never thought about it in that way. That's really neat. Um, I, I I do think there's a lot of merit to splitting up the dose, like you said, at those times. I think where where I struggle in in the explanation is becomes how complicated we want to get and how simplistic we want to get. Right. So guys, like the three of us, might get very complicated in our dosing. Right. We have time. This is what you do for a living. You have all day to think about this stuff. You're from home. You work from home. 
right? We have access to things that the average person who's at an office can't do. The willingness to do that also. Right? Yeah, I don't work with those. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and you and you, right? You and might. Channel, people don't listen. That channel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I can't get people to eat chicken <laughs> and rice, so I don't know how I'm going to get people to do yeah, yeah, yeah. today. I think um, what we found so uh, the, the the group of guys that I'm in. I don't know if you follow some of the podcasts that we do. Yes. I'm in a, a group with Paul and Todd. So we. Um, we were all kind of experimenting on our own with different things. And really what we came up with for, it seems like for fat loss and for some level of muscle growth, if you split up the dosing, like you mentioned, somewhere between, you know, two and four times a day, five times a day, depending on how long you're awake, it seems to have a much greater effect on fat loss and perhaps some steady level of muscle growth. But we also came to the conclusion that if you wanted to put on size very fast, if we use basically the serotonin dosing schedule where you do one gigantic bolus at night, it, it seems to, for all of us, it seemed Todd was the only one I don't think that experienced it. It seemed to bump the scale up dramatically for all of us with the one dose that, mm. and there were less side effects. So this is kind of what we've seen. This is at least what I was shown with HIV is that the, that dosing in particular was used to uh, mitigate some side effects. So the blood sugar issues, basically were alleviated when you do it at night like that. Um, you don't get the, the fatigue. The issue that I have, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, when you, when you split up the dose during the day, especially the morning one with the cortisol, the fatigue during the day is outrageous. It becomes really difficult to do anything, especially when you get the doses high. So if you're using you know, 10 or 12, 15 units and you've now split it up, I, I can't keep my eyes open. Hmm. Versus it, it doesn't I just, last forever. Right. Right, I, I seem to be fine during the day. I will sleep so incredibly deeply at that point that I don't even have dreams, but when then I'm totally fine during the day. And so you're obviously missing a window there too, right? So there's, there's going to be a couple hours in the mid afternoon where you're not really getting, or, you know, evening where you're really not getting any GH response, but clearly it's still doing something. Ta talking about dream, I always thought that GH, there is such a stimuli of hypothalamic function that, that you kind of have like those 4D dream kind of very real. You see real image, almost like watching like TV, you know, is I remember when I was doing a lot of growth hormone younger, there is, there is dream. There was like, it was beyond reality, you know, and as, and it only happened on growth hormone. It never happened on Correct. anything else. And I know? think certain androgens when mixed together also have, a, have an additive effect to that and will change the, the, like the topography of the dream almost. So like Nandrolone to me changes changes the way the dream outcome is versus I think Trembolone does something entirely different with the dreams. I don't know if you guys have-, have You don't sleep. <laughs> I, I think dreams are so, uh, they're so subconscious that even, you know, you're just watching like uh, a killing movie before bed, you go to sleep, you have a, a dream about killing, like that kind of stuff can be like uh, very acute. So I don't know, I've never noticed anything taking GH in dreams personally. So, and I only noticed that the, like what he was talking about, the very surreal, almost realer than real dreams. For me, it, it seems to be somewhere between like three and six at night where the dreams are very surreal and you wake up and they're, it's almost like you're still in it when you're awake. I, I really should, I really should use one of these notebooks and write them down because then you forget 15 minutes later what you were actually dreaming about, but they're so surreal. But when I noticed, at least with me, when I noticed the dose bigger, I noticed the dreams went away when the dose went bigger than that at night. Like, I guess it was, it was just forcing a much deeper level of sleep that I wasn't even aware of my dreams. It doesn't mean I wasn't dreaming. It probably just, it's just changing your consciousness, I guess. So mm -hmm. the, the world of bodybuilding had changed to another level with Tricebo, you know, it's kind of, kind of very low, slow hacking, flat mm -hmm. uh, insulin, almost like 40, 42, 42 hours. And you know, like, I mostly deal with professional that takes hormone, growth hormone four times a day. So my question is like, you know, if your Trisibo is 42 hours and you're not a big fan of Umelo, it's too unpredictable. You find it too aggressive. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, will, will it make sense that the Trisibo is only two or three times a week? Because in some ways, you, to me, the way I see it is, yes, anti-catabolism is good, but it's still part of nature. They they need to have some kind of yes. flux of catabolism to anabolism ratio. It would not make sense to use insulin long acting 
non-stop for, for months, you know? And the thing is, if you do so, if you like inhibit all catabolism, where, where does that lead you, you know? It's very enigmatic for me. Well, and I, you, like you said, you need catabolism in order to grow, right? There is, there has to be both. You can't just be in an anabolic state all the time, right? The process of getting rid of some of this, these old cells occurs when you exercise. So you're, you're constantly slowing out dead things out of the human body. It's the balance at the end of the day, it's which, which you leaning more toward you as a bodybuilder, you want to be leaning more toward anabolism, which these chemicals will help you do. I would say using, you mean like using Lantus, like a long acting insulin? Tristiba is even longer. It's even okay, more so stable. It's an improved Lantus. I would say they would be used more for like that background level of insulin that you'd naturally have anyway, that someone that diabetes doesn't have versus using it to, right? Because it flattens out the response. is If it's similar to Lantus, it's going to flatten out. Yeah. So you're not getting the same as like a Humalog. I, I would say, no, I wouldn't use it. I wouldn't use it to leverage the same way as I would use a short acting insulin. And I don't think that people should, like, I wouldn't recommend that most guys are using insulin constantly, like throughout, right? Like a high day, like depending on the, the situation, I think there's times to use insulin. I don't think it should be just constantly bombarding yourself with it. But what, what what's the actual consequences, like the physical consequences of being overly anti-catabolic? And in some ways, is Trisibo is a perfect catabolism? Is is once you're in Trisibo, you're, there's no... It may be there's some access of catabolism regardless, you know what I mean? I think there has to be some. I don't think you could, so cells would never die. That wouldn't make any sense. There has to be yeah. a life cycle of everything. So you would constantly, you, you're still going to lose something. I would think if you, I think then there would be other side effects that would occur if you were constantly pushing, if the level of anabolism was too high versus almost no catabolism, there would have to be other side effects. You think you think a, an over consistency of anti catabolism will lead to some kind of potassium sparing or or holding or retention? Ex can you explain? What I mean by that is, let's say if you do insulin long term frequently, yeah. mm -hmm. eventually you will you will you, the potassium balance will go oh, up. So we, yes, I just. And again, we don't have a ton of studies with people using that level of insulin long term. Yeah, I know. That's like why that's I'm asking long. you. <laughs> I, I would think it would, yes, I think it would definitely skew that. I, not, not, not something I'd recommend. I generally, again, I insulin and cancer are two subjects that I kind of avoid, if I can, making hard statements on because we don't know the answer to a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I tend to just, I tend to take a pretty neutral stance when it comes to insulin because I don't want, I've noticed I don't know how much you guys see in this. I noticed that there's a lot of young guys now that are skipping the stuff that we all went through. Like how how old are you? Almost 50. I'm 49 now. Okay, I'm 48. I'm 30, so you and I grew up 31. in the same you're 31. So you and I grew up in the same era in this the 90s, right? So like I think that there was different stuff going on and we we had to learn by reading books and there was a different process. I think now guys are bombarded with the internet and all this information and they've sped up this whole process. And I see a lot of young guys younger than you in their twenties that are now reaching for this stuff. And I don't want to contribute to that. If that makes sense. Yeah. I'm like, actually glad you goal, brought that up. My goal is to. Why, is, I, I see insulin without uh, putting a, a, a tone of a political statement. It's kind of preventive, you know, especially with excessive eating. You know me, I'm a big fan of, I would not say isocaloric, but little bit of fasting, a little bit of target keto, a little bit low carb. I believe that the body with training will build muscle regardless. Like you don't need a thousand grams. I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah. That's, that's, I think, I, yeah. That's the, the, way, the, way to, the way to look at it probably then is because we don't, we don't want to put hard facts on something that we don't understand fully. So it's like if you're fully topped up, if your gas tank is full, you don't need to, you don't need any help to get it any fuller. So that's, that's your insulin. That's going to help you get that, that gas tank full. But if it's running on empty, that might be a good time to use insulin. But it's, so what you're saying is it's, it's more beneficial probably to use it sparingly um, and in increments and not so frequently all the time for long durations, because then we're running into the effect of where we're constantly not breaking down cells. So when we're trying to bodybuild, we're getting this effect of we we're really kind of mTOR dominant we're not getting as much autophagy which is like the breakdown and the destruction of cells 
and we want that because we're trying to build the body but if but what you're saying is if we don't have some of that then that's what could cause health issues with with the overuse of this stuff uh, particularly insulin and I, I completely understand why you first of all like I said I appreciate that you brought that up because like you explained it perfectly there are there are a, a newer um set of people that are putting out information regarding using insulin as a beginning stage uh, of your of your journey like instead of using anabolics first you should try to use insulin first and I thought that that was really bad information but I wasn't sure because I wanted to get someone else's opinion on this um, before I open my mouth because as I often do I open my mouth and I say something and then I learn that I'm wrong in the future but I do think that we should avoid giving the advice of using insulin in the early stages of a bodybuilding program for women, for men, for anybody, because first of all, it's dangerous. Second of all, we don't know as much about it yet. Third, it's not really even like anabolic in terms of building muscle. And I think that without GH and anabolics, we're missing the actual benefit from the insulin so yeah i think i think someone that used seven eight hundred gram carb time of you know g cutler type diet uh, unless you're very prone to i eat almost two thousand but i'm 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 naturally leaner than than someone like him but i also not as muscular as him yeah so i i find that's extremely extremely dangerous if it's not if it's not your forte you know right it's, no i don't so and to put it out there, I don't use insulin. Not something I've ever used. Not something I would use at my age. I was out of the bodybuilding scene for a long time, and I got back into it much more recently. Um, I, at, my, at my current age, and my risk factor with children, wife, career, school, I, I have no interest in the risks that are associated with it. I'm glad you said that because I think this is where people struggle. Insulin is dangerous, regardless of what bodybuilders want to think. It is the one drug that you could use correctly a hundred times. You use it wrong once, it'll kill you. Right. You could use testosterone wrong. It, it's not going to, you know, cause harm like that. Mm -hmm. I think that being said, it doesn't mean it's always dangerous. I think there's a time and a place for it. I think if someone's calories, like Benoit said, are over a certain point, right. You need help utilizing those. I, I work with some larger pros that in order to eat, they need to eat a certain amount of food in order to stay that size. They require insulin because their pancreas is no longer sufficient on its own to manage that food. But th these are pro bodybuilders that are 280 solid pounds on stage. These are not 16 year old kids that have never done testosterone, right? These are also guys that, like you also mentioned, that are using grams of gear, right? They're using a bottle of test a week. They're using a bottle of premium bond a week. They're using a bottle of growth hormone a day. They're well aware of the risks. They see doctors. They know that the life expectancy is not that long, unfortunately, for these things. And this is part of their career. Right. If it's just to look a certain way to go to the gym or to go to the beach, that seems ridiculous to me to leverage those things. Yeah. I think that you can use out of I'm not and I'm not against using out of box to look good by any means. I'm just saying I think at a certain level, I think it's way past the beginner stage. Yeah. And it's, you know, you're skipping way ahead to a place that guys like me never need to go because I'll never be at that level. Mm -hmm. Right. My genetics limited me before I would need things like that. Yeah. What 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 would be the, the 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 I'm going elsewhere. I want to go back more. To yeah, the, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so growth hormone, ghrelin, leptin, hunger. Uh, you know that we we have this big trend now. Everyone is on the the general public. Uh, Retratutai, the uh, Ozempic, uh, Monjero, Terzipatid, all the GLP one agonists, which is the 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 taste bud of the tongue going through a pancreatic anticipation of controlling uh, craving and and, and 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 desire and wants and stuff. So that's why I can even inhibit smoking and sugar addiction and blah, blah, blah. So my, my question is like, we have, we see often people that use their appetite to kind of cut their hunger. They do GH for the anti-catabolic of muscle. They do a little bit of sport ART to promote their mass and they get it in shape, you know, and they can sleep without eating, you know, that does that. I find that quite magical because in some ways, for me, I always like kind of, I'm not an emotional eater, but at night it kind of like, I have to eat to sleep. You know, I can eat like a 500 gram steak to make me sleepy, you know, which is almost, almost too much. But if I don't do that, I barely sleep, you know? So I mean, that kind of a- uh, uh, could be a serotonin thing or dopamine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I see there's other patterns. For breakfast, you but in was, the morning might but, be low. 
what 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 do you think in term of the pathology of terzepatide with growth hormone when one cut hunger one promote hunger it's kind of antagonist in some ways maybe it's not smart to do both at the same time but it's an added that we see in many demographic now let's say male physique and stuff not exactly in the pro rank but uh, in let's say the general public I want to look like a, a beach kind of shape and stuff. Of course, using GLP-1 agonist for more than three, four, five, six months would not make sense. Maybe it would change your emotional behavior type in terms of uh, hunger and stuff. But what's I find that the book could explain more leptin, ghrelin, growth hormone interaction, what you could share with us. Well, so I was going, that was, that's an interesting yeah. point. So I started to go off on that tangent when I was writing and I realized that it was going to go into this uh, secretagogues. Mm -hmm. That's why I said in the beginning that I wasn't, in the book, I said at the beginning that I wasn't going to go there because I realized it was going far off. There is a lot of interplay between GLP-1 and IGF. Yeah. So it, I think taking growth hormone with it will, like you said, it will counteract some of the negatives of, of those drugs. We see a lot of anabolics being used too. A lot of these clinics are prescribing anabar things like that, oxandrolone, um, concurrently with these drugs. I, I don't, I mean, that's the unfortunate part of using these GLPs is that they do cause muscle loss, bone loss, right? They are catabolic by nature. So I don't, I mean, if someone's going to go that route, I don't, again, I'm not. Do you consider, the, even if you have the glucagon paddle, you consider them all catabolic? Yeah, I think that, um, but I, again, I'm not endorsing it because I, I, I think there's a need for those drugs. I just think that there, there we, there's a bigger need to address what the issue is with the hunger. Like, I think your hunger thing is more normal. You're an athlete. The, you're aware of what your hunger is. You also aware of controlling that. I think it's with the people who are, the appetite's not controlled, right? And they're using a drug to to make a decision for them. I think that's a problem. And we also don't know the long-term effects of these drugs. They don't use, like, for instance, a growth hormone. We, we studied this on animals, on cells in test tubes, on rats, on animals, um, all these new drugs, they use like a cell model now. So they're just calculating using an algorithm. They don't really know what occurs in the human body with a lot of these drugs that are that come out so quickly mm -hmm. anymore. So I think we're going to see a lot of really strange things messing yeah. with these pathways in the future. Yeah. Uh, well, in inter interesting anecdote. Uh, my stepdad, he takes Ozempic because he admittedly just can't really control his appetite at night and he likes sugary things. And, you know, he will... Now, because he's gone through the, the stages of diabetes and now all this kind of stuff. But, you know, it's like, I love my my sugar Coke. I don't like the diet flavor, um, you know, and I'll make good choices, but I'm going to have like a fruit bowl, which okay. would normally send his blood sugar through the roof. But now that he's on this, his blood sugar never, ever goes up. And for this, for him, for his situation, I think that is truly amazing because that is probably what's going to save his life. Yeah, but for somebody and, else, like you're saying, like for Benoit, it's like if you could just change your habit, if you have control over that, then it's probably the best way just to take care of it yourself. This is like a last resort. This is like I need to save my life because I can't like get the discipline or whatever. And you know, he's a disciplined man, but it's just this one thing. And for a lot of us, we have this one thing. So you all have one like, thing. If I could, take, if I could take a pill and 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 get rid of my my vice probably every man in the world would do that right so and i'm not and, and with, with the ozempic and the, the strokes it, it's designed for diabetes if someone has diabetes by all means that's, yeah. that's for i have i have zero issue with that and same with metformin and those drugs i think the my issue with them is when you start creeping out of that realm right and it starts to be used as a prophylactic for regular people right, right? well then it just becomes they just want to yeah. lose and again then and i know that there's a fine line because then it could, you could you could put any of these things in the same category you could put tremble and you could put botox you could put ozempic they're all drugs that we all abuse to some level to look better right yeah. so where do you draw the line we really can't it's really blurry but i just think that some of these things we just don't know enough about but i think in someone who has diabetes that's what the drug is for it yeah. just doesn't act the same in a non-diabetic well, for sure. And being people will blow it out of proportion in the fitness industry. You take something like that. Okay. It works for this guy. Now it's just going to, I'm going to turn that into a fat loss ad, you know, and try to make some money. Um, yeah. yeah. And I know yeah, you're, sure. you're a big guy. I, I'm, I can tell by looking at you're a big guy. The last thing I'd ever want to do is take anything. It's obviously from eating, right? Like eating is yeah. our friend. Yeah. Uh, you for get sure. that big by not eating food. The last yeah. thing you want is feel nauseous all the time. Yeah. The, yeah. The, 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 learn, the learning of satiety come through true patterns 
The first pattern is breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. So the, the reflex of the mouth through the buccal reflex for, you know, breathing, swallowing, chewing comes with breastfeeding. And in some ways you create uh, oxytocin motherhood fostering in terms of vagal tone and safety. So in some ways we, uh, the, the collective society missing the long-term grass, the breastfed create a, uh, Contra-intellectual instinctive to uh, emotional uh, regulation of food instead of uh, closeness and, and reach. And I'm not to blame the mother for it. You know, we live in a capitalistic city where, where people are so busy and stuff. The mother has to go work and not breastfeed their kid uh, unless it's a very privileged uh, patriarchal structure. But we deinstitutionalize potter structure. So everyone's at work. And the babies buy, you know, a bottle and stuff. And we we change instinctive patterns. If we were all breastfed uh, for five years, the why the human is alive nowadays, we won't have those uh, ozempic uh, trend nowadays, you know? So there will be a return of uh, neuroevolutionary tribal settlement when it comes to early development, because early development allow better DNA through milk, yep. through breastfed, et cetera. So in some ways we have to change or, or remodelate to respect tradition in early developmental of parenting stuff. And that will heal, heal the instinct drive of uh, emotional bonding to food, you know? Because in some ways you're not supposed to spoon fed a baby. The baby is supposed to grab his own food after he breastfed, he, he explore himself because in some ways the peripheral limb of N to reflex integration, neuroplasticity, ghrelin, learning, anticipation of self. But if you spoon fed a baby or you put a screen or watch it in front of a TV, then every synaptic instinctive patterns of full correlation are not integrated properly. And that's where we kind of live in that kind of a food dysfunctional world with so much obesity, you know? Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a correlation to economic, race, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. But that's that's my that's my. Oh, you're correct. And even the act of chewing, right, secretes growth hormone. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I did not know that. <laughs> More so in women, they've done studies with women. Just the act of chewing will cause growth hormone secretion. So there, there's there is research on growth hormone for brain traumatic injury when it comes to neuroprotection, axonal growth, synaptogenesis, neurogenesis, neurogeneration. There's there's good beneficial outcome in 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 brain lateralization, corpus callosum, glial cells. There's a there's a neuroplastic effect of growth hormone. What what you think will be a good dosage to maybe not come like an Olympia Pro, but at least in terms of uh autism or adhd or focus or or maybe just a mediation of self-regulation when it comes to maybe uh i don't know neurotic or a psychotic issue you know not that i want to uh, uh symptomize uh, all of our human mm. uh, fallacies but in some ways what would be the good dosage for a theoretical brain beneficial will it be only two, five units before sleeping and that'll be it. Or how do you see it? Wow. That's really, I, I never thought of those terms. So there is with, with, you're talking about brain injuries, they've done, they've done things with GLP and IGF one. There is a correlation there with brain healing. Um, you probably wouldn't need, it depends probably on the level of brain injury with things like autism there's a lot more research with things like GABA magnesium that I would lean on before I would lean on things like growth hormone per se mm -hmm. I've not seen um I, unless you know of some research I've not seen anything that shows any sort of growth hormone deficiency in people with um autism is, is there something I'm not aware of I will send you study there's there's tons there's tons on, uh, on... is 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 your book is exceptional for hypertrophy but if you use growth hormone as a subject and you want to correlate to uh, all parameter of every organ, every neurotransmitter, every uh, uh, symptom or issue and stuff, then there's a correlation that's kind of encyclopedic, you know? It's, they're both whole rabbit hole and many of them as like mystery still, you know? So okay. your, your your book will be somewhat of a never endless ed edition if you go beyond the hypotrophy dynamic you know okay well I, i'll put this one out there if you want if you you will be you and i can partner and write the second edition if you like 
I don't know if I have your quality of uh, simplicity. We <laughs> I can, I can, I can, I can, I can do the, I can, I can scribe it. We can, I'm saying if you, if you have ideas here that I'm not aware of. Oh, I but... have so many ideas. So for that, I have maybe too many, you know. Well, like, you, got, you got many volumes then. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you 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 do the edit. Okay, we need that. We don't need that. We need this. We need that. Well, that uh, was the problem. Is it was trying to keep it focused and not. So yeah, like, yeah, of course, of I, course. I wrote in an anabolics book um, that I'm hoping will compete with, like you you said, I was like the the modern Duquesne. It yeah. should compete with Llewellyn's book. It should be a better book, more complete, uh, more modern than Llewellyn stuff, uh, and it's almost a thousand pages already. So it's some of these things. It's kind of hard to keep narrow. Anyway, of course. Wow. Do you want to talk about that book a little Which bit? Which book is that? Yeah. I didn't write it. It's not out yet. I'm going to, uh, I'm probably going to have to do it through Amazon so it doesn't get, um, I'm having issues now with the HDH one on Reddit getting copied. Yeah. Yeah. Because I did it as a PDF. What do you mean by that? What do you mean? I don't understand. Which with the Reddit? Yeah. 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 Uh, there's a sub thread on Reddit now where people are downloading my book for free. Oh, so how so I just and and again when I did this, I didn't I wasn't so concerned with it and I wasn't um I wasn't putting up any sort of safety net there. And I, I was aware that this could happen. I just didn't realize that it would have such mass appeal. Again, I didn't know six months ago before I even came public with any of this stuff. I've been doing this in the background for a long time. I never knew until Paul Barnett told me to go public with all this stuff that anyone even cared. Mm -hmm. I think it kind of works in your favor a little bit because the way that it's going to work, you 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 get a lot of people getting that book for free, but now there's so much demand for it. So when it it's no longer no one can find it for free anymore. They're like, it be the same as right. Came, right? It. It go for eight hundred bucks on Amazon used. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So and it is what it is. It's knowledge, and I'm not. I, I, my goal was like I was trying to say before. I, the reason why I do this is because I'm trying to help our community. I'm trying to clean up some of the information that's out there. I just think there's a lot of misunderstandings about drugs and drug use, right? And there's too many people that are getting sick and dying now in the bodybuilding community. And I think if we all, it's our responsibility. People look to people like us to kind of help this situation, not make it worse. We're, we're trying to outdo what some of the younger influencers are doing. Mm -hmm. And I, so it is what it is. It's just information. I will say with giving, you're always winning. You know, it doesn't really matter. You can do like a, a, there's probably software that you cannot reproduce without, you know, kind of serial uh, encoding. I'm sure next book you can uh, self-protect it. But yeah. in some ways, I don't know. You know I didn't get it free. I'll, I'll, I pay for it. You know, no, I know you did. Yeah. And, and, and uh, it's just when, when it ends, I wanted more, you know, I was in, it was yeah, a, well, let's make more. I, I felt Please, satisfied in the muscle, but uh, I have such a, let's say, an interdisciplinary practice, you know, I consider a uh, vagal tone, a vigor, I, I consider immune function, uh, uh, mental health, you know, and there is, there is, and then it's like, it, it, it opened a realm of, you know, the impossible. Um, reading the book, there's the mention of the Jack stat pathways and, it's it's kind of a it's it's not clear for me. I mean, it's a very complex. It's very complex. That's it's very why. complex, and even me, I don't really understand. Can you can you maybe rephrase it publicly right now? What's what's Jack stat? What's important? What's it mention? Why you took the time to kind of go in that really complex realm? Well, because that's kind of the regulatory pathway for this. Um, it's it's the problem is it gets really complex. I don't know how complex you want to get with this stuff. Go ahead. What were you? Were you? All in. Like Janice <laughs> Kinney's all of that stuff is what you're looking yes, at. Yes, yes, yes. Um, it's just it's what regulates basically like gene transcription, um, and signal transduction. So it's um, I'm trying to think of an easy way to explain this. Um, do you want to ask specific questions about it and see? Each time you use GH you change your genetic transcription. It's yes. an adding effect. Yes. For life. Technically. For life? Yes. Are you asking or are you, are you talking? I mean, you mean, mean you, you, when you transcript gene, you cannot go back. So it's kind of- Oh, okay, correct. Yes. It is a one way. It is a one yeah. way. Yeah. It's, uh, so it's like post-translational modifications that are occurring after the expression that you're talking about, because that's a one way. Yeah. 
Correct. Um, and it, it relates to like methylation and acetylation and all of these things. And this is where it gets complicated because there's a lot of different things that come in here and a lot of other genes that play in this. And I think this is where some of the confusion or the lost information on growth hormone is, is we just don't understand where all of these things converge together. And that's exactly where Big Ramy or Ronnie Coleman is and that kind of uh, axis of mystery because for unknown reason, for enigmatic reason, they're hyper responder. Yes, I'll, some of that is probably in their receptor density, similar to androgen receptor density. So we found that what separates, you know, I'll group the three of us in a group together, but we probably all have different genetic response to different things, um, is not so much the androgen load, it's more of the receptor, like the amount you can use, right? And, they, and these receptors will upregulate over time, at least uh, classic steroid receptors will, uh, mm -hmm. the receptors are different, but um it's very possible that a guy like Ronnie Coleman just has many more IGF receptors than I do, right? So he can use less and get much more out of it or more density in the proper places, right? Where I might perhaps have more on a kidney or on a heart, someplace I don't want mm. an effect. The, like the, the big Lenny effect, essentially. Yeah. So it's probably more of an, uh, an effect of, of that than it is one specific pathway like like this like post-translational thing going on mm -hmm. is would be my guess but someone like ronnie coleman or a dorian yates or any of these guys right because we see at least in my in my experience what seems to separate the truly successful pro bodybuilders is their response to drugs and people are gonna not necessarily love that statement but in my experience most people have some level of response to drugs. They're also non-responders as well. But I think it's it's not, they also have a higher response to training and food typically, but the response to drugs tends to be the biggest versus a normal guy, right? The guy, I coach some pro athletes in other sports and at real sports that actually don't respond particularly well to drugs. They've already reached the genetic limit that they're going to reach in muscular size. And when you put them on anabolics they don't change that much their strength might increase mm. a little bit they might grow a little bit but they're not growing they're not going from from where they are to adoring yates that makes any sense so i think that that's, that's yeah. what really separates a pro bodybuilder level or someone who can be that massive is probably the response to those things and that's most likely receptors yeah there's, that, there's, that makes sense there's this one gf which would say uh, some kind of one gf that would maybe since it's a shorter uh, life, like half life, maybe more brain centric, and then there's uh, the one GFLR three, which is kind of a a mysterious function or dysfunction. I I never know how you know beneficial or not it is, or maybe it's both at the same time. I'm I'm kind of in the mystery status right there, and then there's the increlex a kind of. Um, Myth, you know, I didn't collect younger. I thought that there was completely insane, but I I felt I felt maybe a placebo effect of very, very fast adaptation to it, but I had an astonishing surprise gain that even growth hormone had never done. I did yeah. the Selmo Eldritch uh, German version mm -hmm. more than 10 years ago or something. Uh, and then growth hormone. I personally had preferred the growth hormone uh optimization because I find that the LR3 was very triggering in terms of my own blood pressure and stuff. It was too aggressive on me, both in micro dosing or mega dosing. The DAS one GF was okay. MGF works, but so minimally that I didn't really like the frag, the all the peptide GH, all the all yeah. those derivative uh Samarolin. For me, they were all too weak, you know, especially when you're used to growth hormone, both generic and, and formal. I know in the book, you don't like the generic term, but the thing is you have to consider that U.S. custom and Canadian custom are not the same world, you know? And in terms of legislation, uh, no one goes in jail in Canada with steroids, even for trafficking, even having like thousand bottle, they slap your hand, go home, you know? It's not like U.S. where they put you in jail for almost anything. Uh, we don't have that. We have more volatility, even uh, make domestically uh, peptide and stuff. Yes, there's warning, but it's never 
you know, this kind of uh, DEA investigation that put you in jail. You know, I know you had like a, this uh, guy that looks like a UGL owner in the US. He couldn't really, really, really talk, but us in Canada were so freely. So in some ways, generic in US and generic worldwide is very, very different, you know? I uh, just, I was just, even when I clarified the term at the end, right? Say, yeah. so that was more just so people can understand that it doesn't, it doesn't mean, so in the United States, when you talk about FDA approval drugs, right, you have, a, there's a patent, when the patent goes away, and then other companies can come out the generic version, that generic version still needs to pass rigorous standards yeah. in order to be sold, versus all I meant was that there is certain, what we would consider generic, you know, Chinese growth hormone that does not passing any sort of testing at all. They're just literally putting it in their bottle and selling it. I just meant that it's not regulated in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yes, but uh, but in some ways, China, you have to consider that China pay tax. Mm -hmm. Even they pay Bitcoin tax. They pay import export tax. They need a KGG or association that they're responsible of it. They have a frequent, uh, even in independent lab uh, regulation recovery, da, 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 da. and in stuff is is they don't want to hurt for it. Correct. No? So there's there's yes there's a leniency that it's not FDA approved. But trust me, you don't want to kill with generic no, 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 someone not. from China. You will end in jail forever. And Chinese, you know, U.S. jail, Canadian jail, but Chinese jail, trust me, you don't yeah. want to end there. So no. they're, they're pretty, pretty protective in terms of. But anyway, regardless, glass is so controlled at custom nowadays, both international, that now we have domestically made growth yes. hormone. Correct. Yeah. And, and something that... I, I probably learned more after I wrote the book. The but the the generics that I've tested, most of them come out totally fine. I've not found lead, arsenic, any of these these toxic things in any of them, and most of them test pretty close to what the manufacturer's lab tests supply. So the, so there's nothing generally wrong with any of them. They do have more fillers, more binders in them, um, and sometimes the the dosing is slightly off. The milligrams per bottle is slightly off what you would expect. Um, but I've not found anything wrong. The only other thing I've seen that was fake is sometimes they'll put LR3 in the bottle instead of growth hormone. So you get a similar sensation from it without growth hormone because they can manufacture LR3 much cheaper. But I've not seen, like I said, I've not seen anything toxic or poison. I don't think any underground lab has any interest in harming anyone. That's not good for business. Mm -hmm. Very true. I think it's I think it's less common now as I mean, I know there was definitely in Canada, there was some brands that would just completely sell you just straight up garbage, okay. but I think they get weeded out over time, you know, it's because yeah, the internet, I mean, yeah, because how exactly how are you gonna have a business, right? Because people look up reviews before they buy from labs, and all that kind of stuff, right? So people, I yeah. think the market's changed a lot. And it's yeah, now it's so underground uh, GH kits. They're not all created equally, but depending on where you are, you might be able to get some really good ones. And they might be just as good as the pharmaceutical stuff totally. uh, for fraction of the cost yeah and, and some of the european ifbb pros that i that i know use more generics than they do pharma stuff because it's when they're some of these guys are using three bottles a day so it's it's more it's much easier to get financially to deal with that and i think they're they're saying maybe because of the mannitol you get less side effects yeah and it's really working right these guys are massive so it's not like there's something wrong with the growth and if you're going to get side effects if you use 30 I use a day, you're going to get side effects. Mm -hmm. That's a wrong thing. I think the, the biggest issue with the pharmaceutical uh, growth hormones is that in Canada, it's hard to get an actual supply of Canadian growth hormone. So a lot of the growth hormone is being imported. And so most likely you're dealing with, if it is actually from a pharmaceutical uh, company, it's probably not as regulated as like a U.S. or, or uh, a Canadian uh, pharmacy is. So I wouldn't trust those. So you're going to be spending more money to try to get some imported. Or names. You know, it's just like if you can get a, a good underground, then you're 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 good to go. No, no, you know? I'm with you. I don't and, think. And like you said, it's a good point that you said that too, because the more that I speak to well-known pros, top pros, top of the top pros, a lot of them are telling me, "Yeah, well, I'm just I'm now I'm using the uh, I got a good underground lab and I'm using this one now, and yeah. you know it, it works for me." You know, yeah, I've not seen so that, at least yeah. in my experience, I've not seen anything wrong with any of them. It's to, not to say there aren't some that are underdosed, right? But like 
we discussed even gear wise, there used to be garbage gear on the market. I don't think there's that much junk on the market anymore because with the internet, no one's going to buy a brand. If they get sick, they get an abscess, the band's going to go out, they're going to go to business. No one's going to buy that garbage. Well, you know, it's, it's the guys that are selling the underground labs, they're saying use the underground labs and the guys that are selling the pharmaceutical are saying use the pharmaceutical. So you just have to make that decision for yourself. But you know, I, that's, that's why I always like to pick people's brains and what are you taking and, you know, kind of compare that to what I've been doing and, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 like I said, I've used both. Mm -hmm. I, I'm around Seristim, so I use Seristim, but that doesn't mean that that's necessarily what I stand behind because of any particular reason. It's just what I happen to, to get. Yeah. And, and, you know, more relevant for Canadians probably because in Canada, let's say for a, a kit of Seristim, 126 I use, we pay twice as much as a, a U.S. citizen does. So literally, or more, or more. Five five more. Yeah. Yeah. And, I was, I was, the Serono in Canada is 105. It's did we see um, yeah. Chase Irons and I did a, a show a couple months ago on Serostim. And we were we were just talking about the benefits of Serostim specifically versus generics. And that turned out to be a huge financial mistake because it drove up the, the Google algorithm changed the next day. The fourth most searched topic in bodybuilding was Serostim. And it doubled the price on the black market. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. And then there's going to be, yeah, the potentially more replicas and fakes go around now, right? It's yeah, crazy. and yeah. I've seen, and you see all, like, it, it is amazing that the fake, yeah, you're better off just buying a white box with black tops in it than you are buying some of these, what look like pharmaceutical stuff sometimes because half yeah. the time. Yeah, well, people, yeah, people still think, oh, well, it's a pen or it's it's a pharmaceutical, it's got a label on Nothing. it. It's like, yeah. yeah, but when people are invested in making money, they're going to make oh. some good shit to make yeah. you, you know, so convince angels. you. They want your money. Back, <laughs> yeah. back in the day, people would sell uh, people thought if it came in an ampule, like if oil came in an ampule, but it was real, right? You can right. buy a machine that makes ampules. It's just loud. You just don't want to do it in a residential neighborhood, but you can you can cap ampules the same as you cap a regular 10 ml bottle. Yeah, exactly. If you're buying a Primo ampule, I don't think you got that from the pharmacy. Probably not. <laughs> so uh, go, let's go back to the book. Uh, yeah. I know you talk about it, Kirk Haven and, and Kikel also, a great, a great, a great mentor. It's, it was related to 1GF conversion. We know that growth hormone can heal the liver. 1GF could be both pro and negatively inflammatory on, 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 on liver function also. So I know that if you do your 1GF test with growth hormone, it's not the technical perfection of 1GF conversion because high 1GF could be pathological, low 1GF could be pathological. So you want some kind of use of growth hormone with a moderation of uh one gf1 result like more like a stable mm -hmm. uh fashion so in some ways you need correlation of balance in estrogen uh inflammation a1c okay. uh, gtt uh cholesterol you need that kind of a homostatic health so do you will consider clean eating or Kind of a, almost like a monastic respect of having uh, a distribution of eating that's anti-inflammatory as much as possible for the it's like growth hormone hypertrophy needs not the absolute health but in some ways help promote hypertrophy. So yes. in some ways, someone like you know, let's say Lee Priest that does a, a an 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 off season of 50 or 60 pounds over stage weight. It makes so much sense. So it doesn't make sense to influx so much stressor and inflammation for exponential growth. You kind of just suppress. So after writing your book, how you will consider the perfect homeostasis of a blood chemistry level, which is pro hypertrophic component. Okay. So with what you said about a clean diet, I I would definitely agree. So a tree will grow better in healthy soil, right? Than in dead soil that's, you know, devoid yeah. of minerals. Um, and you what, what you're producing the new cells with is the nutrients that your body has, right? I don't think anyone should purposely be eating junk just to get large. And getting your body fat over a certain percentage for most men much over 15 you have some sort of chronic inflammation as well so this is then goes back to what you're saying that's not really that's not really pro hypertrophic to be overweight doesn't make a lot of sense 
right? I think as far as IGF conversion and things like that, I think some of this is misunderstood. And I think um, th this is one of the things that I'm trying to change the, the mass understanding of this stuff. So when you just look at IGF in serum, the problem is the standard test that labs do is not showing the binding proteins. You're just seeing the overall picture. So you can have very high IGF, but it could be, so you have seven, humans have seven binding proteins for IGF. The seventh one is debatable, whether it, it, it's fully that or not, but really one and three are what we're mostly concerned with. Three is, is, is pro-hypertrophic, right? It's going to escort the IGF to the cell and binding protein one is going to be inhibitory. And this is where estrogen comes into play. So you, you mentioned proper estrogen levels, proper estrogen levels. This is where people have gone off the rockers nowadays, letting the estrogen go through the roof. Riding estrogen over the range does not cause an anabolic response. Estrogen is not a classically anabolic hormone in humans when it comes to muscle building, right? It What's has some regulatory. Yeah, so what happens and where this data gets confusing is, and, I, and I've done this firsthand, with cattle and trembolone, with some of the projects I've worked on, what occurs is in a cow, a ruminant, when you feed it, when you give it estrogen and you give it trembolone or you give it growth hormone and you give it estrogen, it grows more. Cows don't produce, ruminants don't produce binding protein one. So estrogen in a cattle or ruminant is anabolic. In a human, we produce binding protein one in response to high estrogen. It is a regulatory response and it's one of the main reasons why women have higher growth hormone and less IGF than a man does because they produce more binding protein one because their estrogen levels are all the time, are higher than ours all the time. So when you see these guys that present lab levels where their estrogen is at 100, 120, 150, these ridiculous levels that you see now, I don't know if you see this. I have all sorts of people that come to me that schedule calls and they have estrogen almost as high as 200 and they're wondering why they have all these side effects and because they were taught now for some reason that mm -hmm. they're supposed to not use an ai that somehow the ais are like this horrible thing now they're only supposed to use masteron the, the, the whole theory now is so out of whack yeah. i don't know i i don't know where any of this stuff came from but it doesn't make any sense it's someone originally pulled data from trembolone and tried to extrapolate it into human data and it, it doesn't line up we're not we're not ruminants and so IGF conversion is it's actually a glucose response mechanism. So it's it's a it's a fed state. It's that pathway is basically to show that you have calories to grow. So your body's not going to make IGF in a in a state where you don't have food. That makes sense, right? Why is your body going to grow tissue if you're starving to death? It won't. Mm -hmm. So the liver, the the liver is looking at nutritional status, and that is what really contributes the most to the IGF production. From growth hormone, not so much estrogen. There is some level of estrogen that is needed, but what's needed is not this crazy level that's super high. That's why there is a range, right? I, so, hope, I hope you alter the industry because I've been agreed to this for almost a decade. And <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not systemic knowledge. You know, it's it's almost like a we're political fighting, stigma. We're fighting the stigma on this now, and the yes, problem yeah. is the, the one that I see that's the most maddening. I'm sorry to keep going on tangents is. The Masteron thing. Again, I'm not against Masteron. I think Masteron is a great drug. It has a purpose. But when when the argument now is you want to use an Masteron, AI. which it acts as a serve, first of all, it's not lowering serum estradiol anyway, is guys will say, well, an AI is dangerous, but Masteron is good. There is not a single study ever done on men with Masteron, ever. It's never been studied. So we don't know its AR affinity. We don't know its ER affinity. We don't know its progesterone receptor affinity. We don't know anything about it in men. We know women with breast cancer. We know it acts as a serum and it caused virilization and it was removed from the market. That's basically the extent of our knowledge with Masteron. So when people will say, well, Masteron is safe to use in gram quantity instead of a Arimidex, which has been FDA approved for 40 years and is still currently used in women, men, and children, right? We still use it for children with delayed growth and it has almost no side effects. Aspirin has more side effects than Arimidex. Mm -hmm. Well, again, and I'm not pushing, I'm, I'm not some, I'm not saying squash your estrogen. I don't want people to misinterpret this. And I'm saying we need to drive our estrogen to nothing. There's, like, there's a range. It it's, just needs to range. Yeah, it's a conversation like like Broderick Chavez would say, right tool for the right job. So I, I do think it's really important that you did go on a tangent to talk about, you know, kind of why there's misinformation going on. Because 
you can look at studies and you can you can create this information and put it out there. Anybody can do that. But someone can read that and they might they might now have this idea that, you know, I don't need to run any AIs. I should maybe have a higher estrogen ratio because someone told me it was anabolic. But for some reason, I'm really not feeling so good and I'm kind of struggling to get through my journey here. It's like, you know, but now these are the same people that are going and asking questions and they're getting the reinforcement that, well, you're all you're good, bro. Like, you, you know, you should be good. And, you know, you're doing everything that we're telling you to do. But there's almost like an epidemic of, of mental health um, issues within like the fitness industry. So so we're, we're trying to solve it uh, in the wrong way, I think. So yeah, and it's yeah. and you see stuff like again, I'm not against any of these things. I just think the wrong, the right, like you said, like Braddock said, like the right tool at the right time. We're seeing guys then using Thomas Arton to manage the water retention issues that they're getting because their estrogen is too high. No, manage the estrogen. Why are you managing blood pressure? If a guy your age comes to me and he's got chronically high blood pressure and I run labs and his estrogen's at 200, I'm gonna manage the estrogen. I'm not worried about the blood pressure on its own. It's a symptom of the estrogen at that point. If I quit, I see guys in their 20s all the time using blood, blood pressure medicine for the same reason instead of managing the actual issue because they were told on Instagram or YouTube by someone with no formal education that that's the way to do it. And it doesn't make any sense, right? And then, and again, and I'm not against using another anabolic. I'm not against using Primo as an AI or Mastron as an AI. But the thing is, we're again talking about this level here. We're talking about us, right? So like if you're running a cycle, my guess is you probably use a gram or two a test. I'm get, I'm just speculating based on uh, your size. And you might use another gram or two of another anabolic on top. And then you probably stack some growth hormone. You might use some, some insulin here and there, whatever. The information is not for you. You're already an advanced user. You already know how to manage your, your cycle. We're, we're talking about young kids here that are using 300 milligrams of testosterone. They've never used anything else. Is the right answer to tell them, oh, you need 300 milligrams of Primo now? Why? It's the first cycle. So why have we gone full circle? Don't block your estrogen. There's still other anabolics on top mm -hmm. in the beginning. Yeah. I, I definitely want to go back. To, I have one one yeah, question sorry. book before we go back to the book, though. I want to just finish that up, but... No, I do think that's very important. The The idea of, it's like the way, I, the way I think about it is categorizing the drugs for what their main, what, what you're trying to get from what the main goal from using that drug is, right? So if I'm trying to use, in my opinion, trying to use a Mastron for the AI effect from it to lower estrogen doesn't make sense because I'm trying to use my anabolics for the anabolic effect. So I, I can understand that Mastron is, it, it does have the anabolic quality. It can help me build muscle and it won't convert to estrogen. So that might be a good choice for someone that doesn't do as well with estrogen converting drugs. It might be more or something. Yeah. yeah, but I'm just like, it's almost like just keeping the drugs in their lane that they're used for. You know, it's like, again, like going back to the insulin, like that's going to be used mostly for topping up and and getting uh, glycogen stores full or, or, or submaximally full, whatever, or, or super maximally full um, using anabolics to build muscle and not, not using them for, uh, if you need to use AIs, choose the AI. But, you know, I think everything, again, this is like, if we're going to go full circle, having the GH, there's a moderation effect here. You're going to, you know, if we're going to go extreme, we're going to go on that, that high end of, of what we consider to be, you know, I guess moderate, but we're, we're trying to find essentially what I'm trying to say is we're trying to find the balance to get the most benefit. So we're making things more complicated than it needs to be because there's a lot of this carryover, like, oh, we should start with insulin or, hey, we're going to use more pre more Mastron. But if we just go back a little bit, we can just see that when we keep things more simple, it works and it's always worked and it doesn't seem like it's going to change. We stick to test, we're going to get good results, things like this, right? So, I mean, I, I, I go on these tangents too because I keep saying things over and over trying to explain it in different ways because I want people to understand this the way that I understand this, the way that you're understanding this, Benoit, we're trying to explain this. Some people who understand it don't explain it well, but I really appreciate how you're explaining it because you're doing- We have 10 minutes better. left, bro. Yeah, so thank so you. We thank only you. have 10 minutes with the expert. So I want to just finish up. Yeah, my, my last question- well, I can come back on. We can, we can continue this conversation over many podcasts. Totally Absolutely, fine. yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll come back to this stuff. Yeah. But I did, I was actually, I had no idea that the GH had varying effects on the different sexes, whether you're a male or a female. Could you talk about that a little bit? 
Well, yeah, that's why. So in the book, in the beginning, what you're referring to is I say that it's sexually dimorphic and I was just going to focus on the male stuff. So mm. it's some of it. I'll try to keep it as concise as possible. Yeah. Basically, it goes back to the estrogen thing with mm. the IG. So you'll notice there are a lot of practitioners now that that focus on lo longer life, longevity, Do doctors that are, uh, I don't know if you call them wellness doctors or whatever, and they're looking at things and they'll use things um, like metformin because it lowers IGF, right? There's, they're using a diabetes drug for a different effect. And they'll say things like lower IGF increases lifespan, right? The problem is that's not true anymore. That has been disproven in men. So in men, actually higher IGF will contribute to a longer life in vivo in nature for you and I, not in a test, not in a cage with rats. What happens is they, they don't run the risk of getting injured. So technically if you reduce their food and you reduce their IGF and the way the IGF is reduced is by reducing their food. Like I said before, they, they can technically live longer because their metabolism is very slow. The problem is in reality, if we reduced your IGF to almost nothing, even though in theory your cells could live longer, you'll go outside and you'll trip over a curb and you'll smack your head on something and you'll die. So the biggest predictor of mortality for men is generally getting injured. So you don't want to reduce things like that. So in a man, it's both biologically normal to have higher IGF and from from things like the growth hormone, uh, you know, the growth hormone will cause that production. Um, and in women, it's kind of the opposite. So you don't necessarily want to force these metrics really high in a woman because it goes against their biology. So it's not just women can't use growth hormone. They don't need as much. They definitely don't need bottles of it. Uh, they can generally get by with like a unit. Like if they're, they're typically looking for anti-aging and fat loss and those types of things. That's a completely different thing than the focus of that book. And like we said before, I would gladly revisit this thing. We can write, uh, I, you can help as well. We could write 20 of these books, depending on what, what avenue we want to go down. That was kind of the issue with this is there's so many things that growth hormone does. Mm -hmm. I was just focusing on our specific world. Yes. No, it's amazing. I, yeah. Does, yeah. So if I say, a good regulatory level of prolactin and 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 progesterone on women will have a beneficiary effect of GH to one GF conversion to lower down slowly incrementally uh, SHBG. So there will be a, um, a pro progesterone pattern and prolactin in estrogen modulation of a woman on growth hormone use will help her SHBG and probably her, her regulatory hormones regardless of, of of use or not. It's those are those are those are human sequence of woman health. Yes. And with we can also do we should probably do something on sex hormone binding glabulin 1.2 because I think that's really misunderstood as well, right? There's again there's a range, there's a sweet spot for it. You don't need it too low and you don't want too high. Yeah. yeah. You know, like the trend is let's use as much um uh proviron as we can, right? To squash SHBG and people don't realize that there's huge problems with doing that as well. Right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. You see that? That's why I put program for <laughs> one of my almost every cycle. Um, That's amazing. We agree on so much. It's it's exceptional. I mean, it's it's uh, like very rare. It didn't happen often in my professional life. Uh, listen, I have two more questions. <laughs> you you talk about uh, systemic and uh, local injection with growth hormone. You seem if I understood correctly, that you kind of like um, local injection because systemic could through organ and stuff. My question is like, I, I was a bit biased by it. I was like, if you inject in your stomach and there's some kind of a CNS, gut access to osteoblast, brain blood barrier, access of growth hormone, maybe in terms of distribution would be good to not overly abuse of... Uh, systemic injection but mm -hmm. yes local injection since bodybuilding specific but systemic has still some kind of beneficial advantage maybe not at the abuse of gh so maybe like let's say three local injection to one systemic in term of how i was pulsatile the way i was doing my four times a day cycle does that make sense to you do you agree to that statement uh, so i that's something that's interesting that's something i've changed my thought on is the the i am versus sub q and i i'm gonna agree with you on the sub q um i i think some of the initial studies look like i am was more advantageous i yeah. 
I'm going to, I'm going to compare it to using testosterone. Does it really make a difference? The only thing that I can say conclusively is that if you use it, I am, it's going to speed up the release pattern, right? So you might get it in your system after an hour or two versus sub Q It's probably three hours. The, unless you're someone who's using it four, five, six times a day, I am doesn't make a ton of sense to me. I, I switch back to using sub Q. I found that I was already putting holes in myself. I didn't need to be injecting more I am than I already was. And it's not really changing. I'm not getting a, much of a different effect. It just didn't make any sense to me. The outcome was no different. And it mm -hmm. seems that there's a reason why the pharmaceutical companies are doing it sub Q. Now, Dr. Todd was arguing with me and he was saying that was because of patient compliancy. I'm pretty sure that the pharmaceutical companies then on their own research this stuff to figure out that that seemed to be the optimal way to do this. It was not necessarily an IM injection. So I would say, I think if you, if you do it sub Q, I think is adequate. I don't, I don't think anyone needs to necessarily be doing it. I am, if someone chooses to do it, I am by all means, you can do it. I am. I'm not sure actually how much localized growth you're going to get from IM versus similar to testosterone, right? My glutes have not grown from, from using IM testosterone injections there. Well, the blood flow goes systemic within. It's different. Second, yeah. So maybe it goes everywhere regardless of the outcome. My last question is something that I never could really uh, professionally explain. So I'm, I'm going to rely on your knowledge to do it. There is a myth that I find in my practice that bodybuilders tend to be more GH oriented and strong men power lifter in the pro circuit tend to be more pro 1GF related. Mm -hmm. It's almost like is 1GF more a strength component? Not exactly. We don't care about hypertrophy. We don't care about aesthetic or function. We just care about the actual primal strength. Is that is that a myth? Is that true? Is that should I comply to that? Or what's your what's your what's your perception? So strength as far as a central nervous system effect? Yes, yes, yes. In terms of strength, I would say that would be more oh. IGF. Right, because growth hormone technically is not, is not technically growth hormone is a catabolic hormone, even though it is building up tissue to an extent, not muscle directly. So it's it shouldn't be stimulating the central nervous system in that way versus IGF would be. I would say that would now I would like you had said before I would always prefer growth hormone and let growth hormone cause an IGF release on its own because I think then you're getting the best of both worlds versus just using Incrilux. Yeah. or L3. Um, but yeah, that would be an IGF response. Now, why? I didn't realize that the strongman would just prefer. So they're using pretty much just Incrilux? Yes, or L3 or DES. Or I would think hormone. the growth hormone would have some advantages too with the water retention and things. I think it would help. Right? Probably she sleep and stuff. Don't care how much do you care about how much I can, you know. Like, you That's so right. interesting. I didn't know that. But yeah, I mean, that would be that would be an IGF response in the brain, not a growth hormone response when it comes yeah. to stress. Which affect lifespan, which affect lifespan. Yeah. So they don't really care. They care for strength. Strength is their interesting. Okay. priority. Wow. Uh, my, my last question before we go. Uh, first, thank you for your book. Thank you to be with us. That was magnificent. I'm glad we agree on so many uh, level. As is, there's a there, there's a I don't know if it's a myth or misconception, but if I understood correctly, growth hormone plus one is equal uh, protective of life, but growth hormone structure minus one will be the E. coli, which kind of kill you. So the growth hormone is actually at the intersection of in-between world between dying and living does that make sense or oh, i'm completely mystical no it, no no, no. I, it doesn't it doesn't not make sense C can you explain it a little more it's, 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 it. we, you we, mean if you remove like one growth hormone comes from like bacteria yes. but the bacteria could be actually very negative yes. for the body so it's it's a it's a it's transduction from an oppositional uh pinpoint yeah, I mean, a lot of things like that, if you change one, if you changed one thing on, right, you would change, if you change yeah. one, if you change one carbon on testosterone, it's a whole different drug, right? Okay. You can, uh, you can make, which never makes to market, made it to market. There's all sorts of steroids that we've made in labs that are totally toxic by changing one carbon. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. Yeah, there's no reason why you couldn't, why growth hormone 
yeah, if you altered it by one, it would definitely it would. That's, that's an interesting point because I think people are pretty easy to dismiss peptides like they don't work, but people will readily believe that GH has like a, an effect in the body, obviously, but peptides don't do anything. A lot of people will believe that, but peptides are just, they're just smaller amino acid sequences. So we would think that if, if a GH amino acid sequence does that, then other amino acid sequences yeah. when injected yeah. would also do things. So especially with the ones that are coming from growth hormone, you're just taking a segment out. GH like fragment. Yeah. It's a perfect well, example. Well, yeah. And you're trying to bypass because we know exactly which amino acid segments do what effect, give or take. We, we're just trying to get an effect like frag. You're just trying to get fat loss. So you're just taking the, the supposed fat loss part out, right? And in theory, it would work. I think there's with, with that, that's interesting because there is also indirect fat loss from IGF, which is a whole nother, we can go on that another time, um, that you're going to miss with fragment that you would get with full GH. And I think that um, a lot of people misjudge side effects for an effect, right? So when you take growth hormone, you're going to get numb hands and swelling in the joints and, and other things that people equate with it's, it's working, mm -hmm. right? Versus if you use BPC-157, you wouldn't get those side effects. So people are like, it doesn't do anything. True. It's not doing anything. It's just not giving you those same side effects or those same effects, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. But it doesn't, yeah, there's no, why, why would, why would this chain work, but this chain wouldn't work necessarily. The same as this chain could also be toxic versus depending on what what segment you pull out. Mm -hmm. Definitely interesting to be able to augment the effects of GH though, because GH is such a blanket hormone, does so many things. We can augment that with different peptides. So whether it's the BPC or whether it's the GH fragment, um, IGF-1, for example, like things like this. So very cool. Um, the, the numb hand thing, the way I see it is, is the way you walk is the way you bite. So the... There's a projection nervous system from the vagal to the jaw TMJ. So if there's jaw asymmetry because of bruxism, cortisol, et cetera, if there's nothing, it's often C1, C7 jaw interaction. Mm -hmm. So it's more about mobility function. Yes, there's water gain and stuff, but in some ways is focus on jaw structure, you know, a good dentist, a good teeth. You see the one that have I1, GF, GH, you often have a, a, a teeth yep. space, you know, they have ex extra palatin wide, they're pretty wide. They're pretty, you know, they have this structural bite, you know, there's a correlation there. Uh, no, but my last question, it was like the, the conjecture of E. coli production to growth hormone. Do you know about it? Or I do it not know. No, but we use, I mean, we use E. coli to, to metabolize other drugs sometimes as well. So there's a relationship between E. coli and a lot of yeah. these things. Uh, I don't specifically know how it pertains to growth hormone. I didn't realize that. Because of the, the E. coli prokaryote, prokaryote to growth hormone production. That's okay. why I was doing, I was saying the the dying living dynamic or antagonist function, because in some ways growth hormone come from a bacteria that's fairly dangerous. And that's where that's it's kind of a mystery of life, you know. That's it's it. pretty it has a mystical effect on the growth hormone, you know. It was too handing in a in a spiritual conclusion. <laughs> I couldn't it. do otherwise, you know. <laughs> couldn't resist. <laughs> well, no, that's amazing. Great way to end. And we went on for a long time. So thank you so much, Kurt, thank for your time. You so much. Amazing. Really, really appreciate it. A book, at um, let's show the book. Let's show the book. Yeah, I just wanted to um uh, let you finish off by um promoting your website and stuff like that. Cool. So um atomiclifecoaching.com. So I'm um I'm a scientist. I'm a, I'm a coach. I coach bodybuilders and lifestyle clients. Uh, my book is available there. My anabolics book will be available on that website when it is uh, published. We also have learning modules. Have you guys, do you guys know about any of this stuff? Nope. Paul, I'm, I'm going to get on it. Book. And, uh, buy it, buy it, buy it. I'll get you guys, I'll get you guys codes. Um, oh, well, thank you. There's So uh, we did similar to J3U, J3U. Yeah. Uh, we did uh, the online merge, but the our modules are more anabolic focused. So they're learning modules about all the anabolic steroids, the mechanisms, how they work, um, how to combine different things, why the effects of all of these things. There's 83 videos on the first section. Well, wow. okay, that's amazing. I'm sorry, we should have started with that. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. But, yeah, I'm definitely going to make sure that we put that information in the show notes and everything. That is so cool. I'm definitely going to check it out. So. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much, Kurt. Thank you, well, man. Thank you. Care, Thank you. Bye. Your mission is essential nowadays. Thank you, man. Thank for you. Your, your common sense, your 
Yeah, you know, you're you're protective of health and there's there's hoping to build Olympia athletes too. Okay. You're not, you're not, okay. you're not uh, suppressing the industry. You're both stimulating, giving knowledge, but also like kind of a r relatable, uh, you know. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's it's magical to me. Thank you, man. Thank yeah, you. Love it. Thank you so much, guys.